to scuba diving, it can be easy to make mistakes because, you know, you, you've never done it before. But I've seen my fair share of new scuba divers and the mistakes that they can make through the students that I've taught over the years. And if I bring some light to some of the mistakes, it can help you get a head start and some mistakes to avoid when you're very first starting out your scuba diving career. A lot of new scuba divers are just so keen to either just just get straight into the water as soon as possible or not want to look like they're struggling with anything that they just rush into getting ready far too early and they end up just standing around fully kitted up waiting for everybody else to get ready or for the boat to actually be in the right position so that they can jump into the water. When you're getting ready or when someone says okay let's start to get ready have, have a look around and see when and how quickly the other divers are actually getting ready. Exposure suits like wetsuits and dry suits, they're made to keep you warm and comfortable in the water. Outside of the water, you're just gonna cook inside, just waiting to get into the water whilst everyone else is getting ready. That they're, they're not made to be just standing around in, especially up in the sun. So set up your BCD and your regulators Organize all of the kit that you're going to need on the dive, like your mask and your fins and that kind of stuff, and then get into your wetsuit. If you get into your wetsuit first, you're just gonna get all hot and sweaty waiting for everybody else to get ready. That being said, on colder dives, it's actually usually better to get into your dry suit early to warm it up so that you're not wasting body heat right before the beginning of the dive, and then you start the dive cold. But always try to pay attention to what state of dress or readiness the experienced divers or the dive guides are and don't rush into putting your wetsuit on too early otherwise you're just going to get really hot and sweaty. Renting dive gear is a good choice when you're very first starting out so that you can start to build knowledge of dive equipment and different things around and you don't have to invest in just absolutely everything at the beginning. However, rental and school equipment is not built for comfort. It's built to be cheap and tough so that it's going to last the dive center a long, long time. People don't tend to buy gear that's designed for school use. It's unless you're a dive center, Nah, don't, don't invest in that. It's not built for like everyday scuba diving. Now, yes, you can dive perfectly well in rental gear, but trust me, it's so much better in your own equipment. Masks are gonna have better silicone, so it actually fits you better, and you get a choice of mask style and features. You're gonna get a pretty basic mask when you first start out and you're renting masks. Regulators, they're gonna have much smoother performance, and you also know when that regulator was serviced because it's something that you have to deal with. And if something is starting to feel off, of the regulator, you know when it's your own regulator because you can sense when something's going off. Whereas if it's a rental regulator, nah, it might just be how it breathes, but it, it's better if it's your own. BCDs and wetsuits are gonna fit you better and they're gonna be made from more softer, more ergonomic materials as well. So again, you're much more comfortable in the water. Now, don't go crazy and buy absolutely everything all at the start because you might end up buying something that you later don't get on with but invest in your own equipment over time starting with a nice mask and then as you learn more about a certain style of bcd or some things and about regulators then move into that and invest over time but don't just rent all of your equipment all the time Delegation is the key to success, especially when complicated tasks need to be done. And when you're very first learning to dive, everything is a complicated task. Most scuba diving accidents are the result of multiple little things just adding up until the diver is either too flustered or too distracted, and then something terrible happens. When you're new to diving, just everything is taxing. So don't expect to be able to do this and that and something else all at the same time or even on the same dive. Try to make your dives as easy as possible by either delegating tasks, 
asking someone else to do it, or just skip it all together if that particular part of the dive is not essential. I used to use a bubble analogy with students. When you're very first start diving, your bubble is very, very small. It's like a bubble of awareness of what you can concentrate on. And when you first start, that bubble really only has you inside of it, not even your dive equipment, just you as a person being underwater. As you start to gain experience, your bubble starts to expand and it starts to include your dive equipment, like your dive computer, you start to think about things and a little bit of your surroundings. And then eventually with experience, your bubble starts to include your dive buddy, the dive site, and even things that might happen that haven't even happened yet because you're starting to think like a more experienced diver, what could happen and what could need to be done at a certain point. When you're brand new to diving, don't rush into doing absolutely everything at once. Add one new skill at a time, you perfect it, and then you build onto the next thing and really build those strong foundations. But don't try to rush into doing absolutely everything all at once. Just, you know, go diving, build those foundations and build that confidence. Scuba diving equipment can barely be described as nimble in the water, but outside of the water, it's downright clunky and you should spend as little time as possible fully kitted up outside of the water. If you can, assemble your equipment as close to the water as possible and put it on as close to the water as possible. If there are multiple places where you can get kitted up on a boat, I'm usually towards the back or at least where you're gonna enter the water. So I don't have to walk the entire length of the boat wearing the equipment. It also keeps the weight of the, the, the tank and your weight belt off of your body because that can really do a number on your back over time. Your fins as well. Most people struggle to walk around on a boat without fins, uh, without stumbling at the best of times. But whilst wearing fins, you're just begging to fall over because now your feet are three times longer. If you need to walk in fins to get to the entry or exit point, then hold onto a rail if one's available, take your time, walk sideways or even backwards whilst paying particular attention to where your fins are going so you don't stub your fins into something and then trip because you've got all that heavy equipment on you, you're gonna go down. But be very grounded when you're walking and don't shift your weight until you're absolutely certain that you can maintain your balance, you're not gonna slip and fall. Regulators are designed to give you air at a moment's notice and they work best when submerged, go figure. But on the surface, they can get a little bit confused and they think that you're breathing even when it's out of your mouth. When you're in the water and you take your regulator out of your mouth, point the mouthpiece downwards. If you point it upwards, then the regulator is going to spit. And of course that will then lead to a free flow. You're gonna lose a bunch of gas and everyone's gonna point and laugh at you. It, it's just how regulators work. But when you're getting ready to jump into the water, you don't have to worry about the regulator in your mouth, but you do have to worry about your alternate, your octopus. Turn the pre-dive lever on and increase the breathing resistance if you can, if the regulator model allows for it, and try to point the mouthpiece downwards so that when you jump in, the purge button isn't the first thing that hits the water. And then at the end of the dive, when you take the regulator out of your mouth, point the mouthpiece downwards and then pop it into the water. It's always mouthpiece downwards, even if you're completely under the water and you need to swap second stages for whatever reason, try and point that mouthpiece downwards so it doesn't free flow. So many divers, as soon as they reach the surface at the end of the dive, off with their mask, regulator comes out and they just focus on like life on the surface again. But if you still have gas in your tank, it can be really useful to keep that regulator in place and the same with your mask. I've watched so many divers struggle on the surface as waves just slap them in the face. They then choke it down trying to get back on the boat and you know see where they're going with these waves splashing over their face. But you know, what would be really good is like some kind of mask where you can see through the water and a regulator so you can breathe underwater. If it's nice and calm and there's very little water movement, 
yeah. You can take your regulator out to chat with your buddy and get some fresh air. You can take your mask off to kind of rub your face, but on your exit, when you're trying to get back onto the boat, if the waves are jumping, it's nice to keep your eyes covered and be able to breathe if you're suddenly dunked underwater as if you're holding onto a ladder of a boat. And it's also handy so that you don't fumble your mask or like a rogue wave just snatches it from you because you've just taken it off. There is no dive equipment that is worth more than your life. If I feel like I can't stay on the surface and something is, that I'm wearing is weighing me down, I will not hesitate to drop it and get rid of it. If you're lucky, your insurance is gonna pay for it anyway, and it's a good excuse to you know go shopping for some new scuba diving equipment. Now, ideally, you should only wear enough lead so that you can just submerge, but be able to stay on the surface even with an empty BCD with minimal effort. You should never be overweighted on a dive. But ditching your weight belt, of course, is the first option. That's really a no-brainer, but you still see divers from time to time struggling on the surface and literally risking their lives instead of just dropping their weights. The last thing that I'll ditch is probably going to be like my fins, my mask and my dive knife. Everything else is dead to me if I can't float on the surface. And it can really make for an interesting search and recovery dive to find your lost gear if it's nice and shallow enough and you can remember where you dropped it. While we're on the subject of weight belts, your toes will thank you if you always carry them by the strap end and never by the buckle. Coated leg blocks are better for the environment, but the smooth surface, especially when wet, can be very slippery. And when you hold a basic weight belt just straight upright by one end, those lead blocks can slip right off onto whatever is underneath, which is usually your foot. Now, Weight retainers are handy to prevent this, but they're a bit of a pain if it's not your lead and you have to unthread it all the time. If you're only like on a one day or a two day trip, it's, it's a bit much. So if you're in a rush, a single twist in the webbing midway through threading that lead can actually help that hold that lead block in place. Uh, but I'll always still hold the weight belt by the loose strap end because even if the lead does slip, it's not going to slip over the buckle. You're going to be a bit lopsided, but at least you're not going to lose the lead or break your toes. This one is a little heartbreaking because when you're new to scuba diving, you're experiencing all of this amazing new underwater world. And especially in today's social media life, all you want to do is share that with others. But when you're very first learning to dive, you kind of need to practice your buoyancy and a camera is going to ruin it in a few different ways. And it kind of goes back to task loading. The first thing a camera does is it narrows your vision because you're just looking through that little viewfinder. Without your peripheral vision to see if you're floating or sinking as the background moves around you, you can very easily end up with a runaway ascent. The other way that a camera can ruin your buoyancy is a lot of people naturally hold their breath to hold that camera steady when they're lining up a shot. And of course, now they're floating away. So trying to leave your camera behind until you're something at like 20 or 30 dives and much more confident with your buoyancy. And if you do want to take a camera down, you're still not too sure on your buoyancy, at least ask your buddy to keep an eye on you whilst you're taking pictures to alert you if you're starting to drift off so they can either grab you or just you know alert you so that you can refocus on your buoyancy. I don't know anybody who actually enjoys removing their mask underwater or other fundamental skills, but it is important that you actually do them from time to time so that should the time come where you actually need to disconnect your low pressure inflator hose and reconnect it underwater, you can do it because you've been practicing it. To be able to drop and find a regulator or clear a flooded mask, it, if it happens just out of the blue and you haven't practiced it since your open water course, then, oh, Struth, what do you have to do? Oh yeah, you tilt and do this. It is much better if you actually practice it. Not on every dive, but from time to time. The best time is somewhere nice and shallow, 
where you can ascend to the surface should you need to um, if you like get a mouthful of water or something and you suddenly panic then at least you can get back to the surface now the safety stop at the end of a dive seems to be the perfect time because you've got three minutes of just hanging there with little else to do but remember it's best to actually practice the skill at the end of those three minutes when your computer says that yes you're okay to ascend then practice those skills because you're okay to ascend and do tell your buddy that you're going to practice some skills so that they know what you're doing and they're not going to interfere or screw things up but the more you do a skill and the more you do a skill properly the less of a problem it should it'll be should something happen during the next dive if someone kicks your mask off or dislodges it it's not the end of the world because you've been practicing it it's just nice and easy if you have any mistakes that you've seen or you've grown out of then let us know down in the comments section below and do me a favor and give this video a thumbs up if you could um, please and subscribe to the channel as well if you want to see more scuba diving advice videos if you have a question uh, that you'd like me to answer pop that in the comments with the ask mark hashtag and i'll respond in a video as soon as possible i also have to mention our website and our magazine that you should really check out we publish three different magazines around the world that you can subscribe to um, check it out scuba diver mag.com that's it for today thank you for watching everybody and of course safe diving